Knowledge for Men, episode 94. Welcome to knowledgeformen.com, where you're going to grow into the man you want to be. Your life will never be the same again. I can guarantee it. Hey guys, one of the questions I've been getting a lot lately is, can you put together a list of the best books and success quotes from all of your guests and combine that into one guide? And so I've actually just done that. It's called the top 30 books and success quotes every man must live by. So out of all of the podcast episodes I've done, over 60, I finally put together this guide and you can download it for free at kfmfree.com. Again, that's kfmfree.com. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with Matt Davis. He's a former stand-up comic turned journalist, podcaster, and entrepreneur. He specializes in obstacle racing and mud runs. He's actually competed in over 50 events of every distance and difficulty level, and he's now the author of Down and Dirty, the essential training guide for obstacle races and mud runs. Matt, happy to have you on the show here. Hey, man, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, let's get right to it. What's your favorite success quote, and if you can explain to the audience why? Well, I'm going to choose one that comes from my dad. He is a uh, lifelong salesman, one of those guys that could sell ice cube Eximos. And uh, he taught me a long time ago, if you don't ask, you don't get. So I've applied that everywhere in my life, in business, and personal relationships, in asking a girl out. If I make the excuse they're not going to want to buy because, or I'm not good enough to do this because, then I'm shooting myself in the foot. But if I ask, the worst they can say is no, and a lot of times they say yes. (laughs) Yeah, I like that. It's amazing what you can get when you just ask. You know, it can be business from a friend, personal relationships, someone that you're in a relationship with. I mean, just, just ask, and you'd be surprised at what you can get. Yeah, man, I like it. And Matt, you got quite the background here. You've been in multiple different industries, stand-up comic, journalism, you're an author, entrepreneur, you have your own podcast program. Let's hear your story. Go ahead and take the mic and lay it on us. Let's go. Sure. To whittle that down, I guess, that's like 42 years of life into uh, into a brief intro, is sometime in my early 20s, I decided I wanted to be a comedian, and more importantly, at that time, I thought, well, I want to be famous. I want to I live fast, die young, and like have a big house in the Hollywood Hills and have outrageous parties and do drugs. Like That really was my, my goal in life. And instead, what happened was I moved to Los Angeles after doing stand-up a few years and actually hit bottom pretty fast and decided that <laughs> drinking and drugs weren't going to be for me anymore. Uh, but I still did stand-up for a while, and I started my first business, which was a staffing company, and it did really well. But after a while, I got bored with that. And it, it wasn't fulfilling me personally, like the notion of not having a boss wasn't enough to keep it going, which is what worked for the first few years. Just, hey, I don't have a boss anymore. I, I get to run my own company. And then I fell into obstacle racing like a lot of people did. I did a couple of races and got really hooked. If you read the book, you can hear specifically how a friend of mine was going to do one and he was in worse shape than me. And so I decided I'd take it on. But what happened was I sort of got bit by the bug, uh, as people do, by doing a couple of these races. And it really took over my life the kind of people that do them, uh, I was attracted to because these were people who wanted to better themselves. They wanted to be part of the community. They wanted to help each other. And that's why obstacle racing itself has grown like a shot over the last few years is number one, really cool pictures on Facebook. And number two is this whole community that's popped up around it. I always say the races are great, but we wouldn't keep coming back if it weren't for the people. So that's kind of what happened to me. And uh, I found myself I started this podcast for fun and for free. It got a following pretty quickly because people were hungry for content. And that led to what is now the website, Obstacle Racing Media, and the podcast, and now the book, and who knows what's next. (laughs) All right. So quite the lifestyle there of dreaming to party hard in the Hollywood Hills uh, in Los Angeles to now what you're doing now with Obstacle Racing and the whole um, media site that you're running. I'm wondering, what was that transition period? Like, what was it that really led you outside of Hollywood into what you're doing now? Well, what happened first was that I did, I I started this business just sort of on a whim, like no business plan, no business degree, no real anything. You know, and as you mentioned, I I had done, I'd been involved with some men's organizations and I had a lot of help with my life and physically, well, spiritually and emotionally and mentally, I guess. And it kind of got me to see that, you know, I was one of those guys that everyone said had a lot of potential but couldn't figure out why I could get my shit together. And so... I started this business on a whim. It started making money and, you know, I got married. We started having children and it became, and I just didn't, I just didn't have the pull of that anymore. I didn't want to do stand up. 
I never quite said, Hey, I quit the industry. Like, you know, I'm fed up and this is over. I just found myself doing it less and just found that it wasn't appealing to me anymore. But clearly there was this creative part of me still dying to get out. And I just didn't know what it was. And then I started interviewing athletes and race directors and found that I had a knack for it. The interesting thing is, you know, you want to talk about success stories. When I was a boy, my first heroes were Bob Costas and Howard Cassell. So before I even wanted to be a stand-up comic, I wanted to be a sportscaster. And so lo and behold, the way life goes, here it is all these years later, and that is what I'm doing. And I've turned myself into a journalist, turned myself into a podcaster. And it turns out it's kind of what I've always wanted to do. I'm getting great feedback from the community about it, and it brings me a lot of joy. Uh, it's starting to bring in some money, too. And so, you know, they say when you can match your vocation and your avocation, then you've made it. So I feel like I'm on the way. Huh. And you said something, Matt, that really stood out to me. You said, I had a lot of potential, but didn't know what to do. So what did you start to do to really figure out what direction to start heading in? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's one of those things, dude, that a student is ready to teach her peers. And, and I wasn't ready to change until the moment I was ready to change it, right? So I've done all these seminars. I've read all these books. I'd gotten sober. Like my life was slowly getting better, but it was still a lot of two steps forward, one step back. And at some point, I broke through whatever the heck it was that was holding me back. And I wish I could point to one thing, but I can't. I think the biggest thing I can give, though, is just like the fall down 99 times, get up 100. And that's the, that's the deal. I mean, even when I started my staffing company, early on, it wasn't making enough money to feed my family. So I kept other jobs, but I never quit. And I've seen people start a business. Six months later, they don't make any money. They go back to their day job. And not that that makes them a bad person, but they just you know, they gave up on the dream too soon. And that's the one thing I've never done is that I've always stuck it out and always said, okay, let's take another bite at this. Huh, yeah. So you have this persistent attitude towards life and, you know, in all aspects of life, it, you know, that's what I'm seeing here. And now I'm wondering why obstacle racing? You know, there's so many other ways to challenge yourself physically and mentally. What led you to obstacle racing specifically? Yeah. So doing these races, what I found and what a lot of people find is it's this joy and freedom that I had as a kid. When you're a kid, especially guys, you don't care about getting dirty. You don't care about getting hurt. You just go and you go until it's time to come home. Like when the streetlights come on or your mom says, Hey, come inside. And when you're face down in, in a crawling in a barbed wire and mud and you look at one of your friends or even a stranger, you're like, can you believe we're doing this? Like, what are we doing? And it's awesome. It's like, I'm not in my office. I'm not in my car. I'm not, I'm not paying the bills. You know, I'm out here in the dirt, in the earth, and uh, I'm getting dirty. I'm being physical. You know, a lot of stuff that for uh, for further reading, if people want to read, you know, Joe DeSena's book, the guy that wrote, the guy that started Spartan Race, that's pretty much his whole philosophy is that we've been like this for millions of years, and then we got comfy and liked our Starbucks. Uh, and once we get out there, like we did when we were running from animals or hunting our own food, we realize how much joy there is in that because naturally, you know, we're, we're born to run, same thing. Like, I'm sure a lot of people have read that. It is our natural state to be active, to be physical, to sweat, to be scared. And so obstacle races bring out all of that along with this camaraderie that we've talked about. Yeah, you know, it brings out the tribal spirit. You know, I could I could see that. And, and to verse today where we live these comfortable lives and even though some of us may not think we're living comfortably, we're much more comfortable than we have ever been in history. So you've done over fifty of these obstacle races, Matt. Now, I'm wondering what's going on through your mind during the race? Pretty much everything, you know, everything from why am I doing this to this is the blast to I hope I get this certain obstacle that I failed last time to I hope there's a water station up next. Uh, you know, I do what a lot of people who've done these things a long time do now. And what I'll typically do is I'll run a race in the morning for time, right? Push myself, test myself. How, how good can I do against my competition? And then later in the day, I'll do it a second time, either with other people that just want to do it a second time, or maybe people will take out someone that's never done it before, their cousin, their brother, their, their coworker, because they know that they're not going to be able to keep up with them on their competitive lap. But then they literally show them the ropes on the second lap. And, you know, you help each other over walls and you, you know, just kind of experience it with them, which is one of the really cool things about what we do. You can have both. You can absolutely be a, com a competitive athlete and you can do it for fun and for laughs. Yeah, so on these longer races, some more challenging races, or when you're doing it competitively, what keeps you going? You know, it's challenging. You've, you've done so many races so far, 
and what keeps you going? What's preventing you from quitting? How do you, how do you overcome that voice inside of your head? That's a really great question because I've been faced with it a lot now that I started to get into some ultra races and I've DNF'd some races, which is short for did not finish. And those were because of certain races have time cutoffs. So if you don't make them, they pull you. And I've had that happen to me where I just ran out of time because I wasn't fast enough, but I didn't quit. I didn't, you know, I didn't throw in the towel, even if every part of me wanted to quit. Luckily, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who've given me a lot of great coaching when it comes to these things. So what they mostly say is, as lame as it is, it's one foot in front of the other. It's, can I take one more step? Okay, great. And then you ask yourself the question again. Can I take one more step? And that's it. Not, can I take a hundred more or not? Can I make it five miles? It's okay. Let's sometimes you break it down to that. Okay. I'm going to go five more miles, but sometimes it's okay. I'm going to go one more mile and then we'll reassess or I'm going to take one more step until my feet don't work anymore. So it's a, it's a huge, huge, the mental aspect is massive, a huge part of it. I can't, that enough yeah that's so powerful just really thinking a few steps ahead of you you know a lot of times knowledge for men can get really overwhelming and i always just tell myself you know get through this one task you know let's let's get this done let's get this done before noon okay let's get this done before this evening 5 p.m you know just get through this day and just take it step by step and when i look backwards it's like wow look look at all that i've achieved so matt now you know I'm, i'm looking at the history of obstacle course racing and where it's at now. Yeah. Well, when I was working with my publishers on this book and we wrote a chapter on the history and they said, we want to do a chapter on the current state. I said, the current state changes so much that some of this information might be outdated by the time it's printed and it, and it already has the short, you know, the down and dirty, no pun intended version is there's this race in the UK called tough guy, which you can Google tough guy, UK, and if you see it, it look a lot like Tough Mudder, you know, electric obstacles, cold water obstacles, that kind of thing. Or a lot of, a lot of obstacle races do, but specifically, it's kind of where Tough Mudder got sort of their start from was this English race. And then it kind of just caught fire in the United States. And in the short time it's been around, it's already had this sort of boom and bust, but still going thing where last year, a lot of races went out of business, either because they had a poor business plan where they just couldn't keep up, and some flat out just sort of, you know, shysters out there. But the biggest races that most of your listeners have heard of or probably even done it are Tough Mudder, uh, Warrior Dash, and Spartan Race. Uh, and there are some other companies who are coming along. Savage Race has been around almost since the beginning. They do a phenomenal job. There's a new race called Battle Frog Series. They do a phenomenal job. And there's a ton of local mom and pop ones. But no one's really sure what the future is because as I spoke to, there being sort of the two levels of it, the, the fun part and the competitive part is some want to make it a sport, like a real sport, right? Like triathlons or, or anything else. And some think that's really not where it's at. It's more just about the masses. And so the history is being written every day with the sport. There's so much happening so fast. We never know what's coming around the corner. A new race pops up, a new ra- uh, and another race folds, a new athlete pops up, someone that was doing really well gets injured. So I think the growth is certainly up. It's, it's why I've chosen to keep it as my business because I feel like it's growing. But we're really unsure about exactly which road it's going to take. Huh. And do you think this is something that can go mainstream, though? Well, you know, will it ever be as big as, like, basketball or baseball? No. But, you know, there are a million sports on ESPN2 or 3 uh, or the Ocho that a lot of people have never heard of. But there's ardent fans. There's thousands of them, and whenever there's thousands of fans, there's sponsors behind that, right? So people like to point at CrossFit a lot, or they used to. They used to follow sort of the CrossFit or MMA model. Hey, these things, hey, these things are on the fringe, and now they're mainstream. But there's a million other things, you know, that, that there's sports around that who would ever guess they'd be sports. I mean, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head, like competitive eating or People that dive really far depth is a sport, right? And and so few people know about it, but they get sponsors and they get money behind it because there is eyeballs and there are people interested in that. So mainstream is kind of a broad term. I know that once upon a time when I would explain to people what I did for a living, they didn't know, and now they do. So I know that's that's part of it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing, though, a good sign. Well, the other thing is that I'm in a, these Facebook communities and these real-world communities of Oscar racers, and I'm in a, I'm in a group in Georgia called Georgia Obstacle Racers and Mud Runners or Gormer. And I see that every week someone gets on that page and says, where have you guys been all my life? Excuse me, I've been doing this for a year. I'm the only one in my office crazy enough to do it. I'm so happy I found my people. 
Then they meet us at a race. They say, where's the next one? So I see that. That to me is the biggest sign that, that it's healthy and growing. All right. And so if there's someone listening right now and they're kind of interested in obstacle course racing, you know, how, how much training is involved and how much time and preparation is involved for one of these races? Yeah, I would say this is the biggest thing I would want to impart to new people is that if you wait until you're in shape, quote unquote, to do the race, you will never do the race. So you've got to just sign up today. You've got to put your credit card down and sign up for the race. And now you've got that goal to go do the race. And then there's all kinds of training online, right? Is there like, what's right for people? I started out as a runner. I did zero physical, I did zero upper body strength exercises for my first race, my first top runner. And so I failed a lot of obstacles, but I didn't care. I was just excited that I could run 10 miles and I did the race. Then I did my first Spartan and I failed a lot of obstacles again. After a few races, I go, okay, enough of this. I'd like to start working on my upper body. So I started doing push-ups and pull-ups and all that kind of stuff and burpees. Uh, some people are the other way around. They, they, they love the gym. They love to do CrossFit. They hate to run. So you got to go out and start running a couple miles. But at the end of the day, the difference between a really fit person and a not so fit person is time. So if you start out with a five mile obstacle race and you walk part of it or walk half of it, who cares? You're going to have a great time anyway. You, you do a slow jog when you can, you come to the obstacle, you try it, you make it awesome. You fail. Okay. Now I know what I need to work on next time. Yeah, great advice. I mean, they say the best time to invest was, you know, 20 years ago, you know, 10 years ago, but the second best time is today. Exactly. And so even, you know, like when I started this website, I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew that I wanted to do it and just started just, and and much like yourself, it sounds like. Well, yeah. I mean, that's what I was going to say to you with the don't ask, don't get, like you reached out to some pretty big names. I'm sure there's part of you that says, well, that person isn't going to talk to me, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's so many rejections that I go through. Like, I, I really had no idea what I was doing. When I started, you know, like I said, I, I just really pushed through it. And I just go through rejection after rejection. And I'm just as enthusiastic on the hundredth person as I was on the first person. <laughs> so one of the big things I wanted to focus on was I know you have a background with men's groups and, and, and men's development groups. And so uh, why specifically do you feel like uh, obstacle course racing is good for men? That's another great question. Well, I'll speak personally that for myself and for men around me, we do really well when we're in action around something. And thinking is great, and reading is great, and writing is great, and obviously intellect is a, is a, is a whole other skill and, and thing. But when we're in action, and the blood is flowing, and the adrenaline is flowing, and testosterone is flowing, it's pretty awesome. And we get to experience what it's like to be in that power, right? I mean, I've done things in the last three years that I never could think possible. If you asked me even a month before I did my first race or before I got started training, like, do you think you'll ever run 10 miles? I think I would have said no. So there's so much value in that, in using our bodies and being physical. Also, if you like looking at girls that aren't wearing that much, it's a great place to go because there are so lot, there's an awful lot of that. <laughs> All right. And so, Matt, are you ready for the Null Drone? I'm ready. Do you ever have so many books to read that you end up not reading at all? You have so many books in your library on your list of books that you want to read, but you don't know which books to tackle first. I know in all of my episodes, I ask guests, what are your favorite books? What are your most influential books? And they always list three or four. And I always ask guests for their favorite success quote. I find that quotes can be so powerful sometimes, yet... There's so many available. So what I've done is I put together a list of the top 30 books and top 30 success quotes that I think every man must live by. And these are directly from guests on the Knowledge for Men podcast. And as you know, some of the guests on my show sold their companies for millions of dollars. They're running billion dollar organizations. They're dating coaches. They're health coaches. They're entrepreneurs. They're celebrities on TV. They're mixed martial artists. Just this wide variety of great minds. And I put together a list of the top 30 books and top 30 success quotes that every man must live by. You can download this guide for free at kfmfree.com. Again, that's kfmfree.com. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives. Starting in 3, 2, 1, showtime. All right, Matt, how would you explain obstacle course racing to a newcomer? So obstacle racing is human beings. That's the first thing. Some people think it's automobile related when I say obstacle racing. 
Oscar racing is human beings running on a on a known or not so known course with on dirt typically with obstacles in the way, and those obstacles range from walls to climb over, barbed wire to crawl under, fire to jump over, water to go through, ropes to climb up. Obstacles in the sense of things that you would see on sort of a, a basic military course is what a lot of obstacles are. There's also really fun ones like slides and swinging ropes as well. All right. And Matt, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's feeling kind of lost or unsure of what they should do with their life? So the best way to find purpose, I think, is to, first of all, get good, get good counsel. Find men around you that, that tell you the truth and that even when it's ugly, and then have them help you figure it out, but start putting pen to paper. Things tend to exist in the universe when we write them down, and when you start writing out what they might be, you kind of have a clue of what that, of a general idea. But again, it becomes, I'm always going to get back to you, never wait, the time is now. If you wait till you have enough money, time, or you look a certain way, or you weigh a certain amount, it's never going to happen. If my wife and I waited till we had, quote unquote, enough money to have children, it would have never happened. Yeah. And what was holding you back from becoming the man you are now today? Uh, a lot of self-doubt and a lot of self-sabotage that got in the way of that. Like I said, fall down 99 times, get up 100. And that's the thing that kept me going was I never gave up. And that, you know, I've had good men around me that have, that have helped do that. All right. And can you name a mentor, someone who's played a large role in your development? How has this person helped you? Wow. Well, I mean, I've had, I've had a lot of... Uh, a lot of people, and specifically uh, men around me, that had been, you know, some of them are like mentors, but some of them are like just like brothers, and brothers in the true sense of the word, not like not in the fraternity sense, but in the love me unconditionally. As I said, tell me the ugly truth, even when it's ugly, like, hey, dude, you're fucking up. Or, hey, dude, when are you going to get your shit together? They've given me, uh, the, the men specifically that I'm around in, in Georgia is on a, I'm on a, in a men's organization, which broke off of something called Men's Division International, and our team is called Tribe, and they've given me, man, they've given me so so much. Uh, but mostly, what they've given me is to is to remind me to remind me how great I am, and that and to go after things. Mm, men like that can do wonders for you. I can see that. And can you name three of your most influential books, Matt? Uh, also, awesome question. So, I really like Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea, the guy who wrote the Zappos book. He's, uh, he's one of my heroes for sure. And why? Why is just because what I love about him is that he's not this like rah-rah guy, right? He's not this like Tony Robbins rah-rah guy or this like effusiveness, like, but he created a culture that bred that because of just who he is and what he wanted. Like, he's like, I'm bored with my job. How can I create a company that's not going to have me be bored? And this unbelievable explosion happened around him just by being that way and holding that context. I would say for trying to think of books I've read more than once because I've like I've read a lot, but I would say I, I mean I, I have to I have to say Born to Run be, just because it sort of helped launch this whole thing for me when I first started running three years ago. I read that and it just it got into me in a way that it gets that it's gotten to a lot of people, which is why ultra running has taken off and you know running in general has just because that story spoke to me and it made me want to go out and run 100 miles. <laughs> I mean I can't really. I can't really think of anything other than that. I mean, more specific. Oh, The E-Myth, number one book. Anybody who's starting a business tomorrow, read The E-Myth. It really, like, if you, like, apply for a small business loan, they should give you that book. Every mistake I made in my first seven years in business was all in that book, laid out, like, almost word for word. You have to get that book if you're starting a business or really want to do anything. I think you should get that book. But specifically, entrepreneurs, it's a must-read. I think if you did get an SBA loan, it should come with many books, and that should be one of them for sure. Or even if you say you want to be a business major, they should just give you that book. And you're not you're not set, but that should be a required reading, The E-Myth by uh, Michael right. Gerber. And just heads up, guys, you can pick up any of these books at kfmbook.com. You can get this all you know one of these books in audiobook format at kfmbook.com. All right, and Matt, scenario here for you. Imagine you had 60 seconds with your 20-year-old self. What would you tell them to do, and what would you tell them not to do? Oh, boy. Do, do people usually cry when you ask this question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it is an emotional question, so I think it depends on the person. It really is, like, like it's an emotional question. 
what I would tell my 20 year old self is everything these guys have been telling me for the last, you know, 20 years. Tell 20 year old Matt to believe in yourself. You really can't do anything you set your mind to. Be as loving and giving as possible, and that's what you're going to get back. All right. And what would you tell yourself not to do? Well, see, that's one of those things. It's like all the mistakes and all the and all the quote unquote regrets. Like that's where pain and learning come from. So I, I don't I don't know that I could that I could say not to do anything because anything that I did that didn't work out still brought me here, right? Yeah, yeah. I respect that. I respect that a lot, actually. And now looking back at your career, you know, going to Hollywood Hills and dreaming. You know, you know your goal is to just party hard and live it up there to going into, you know, stand-up comedy, journalism, podcasting, and obstacle course racing, and now you're an author and you have this media company. What is your philosophy on life? Well, I think that last thing I said about it, like, be as loving and giving as possible, because I think in in times, I think that's what I would tell, that that actually reminds me what I would tell myself, is like, don't be selfish. That's the one thing I would say, don't be, because I think selfishness is is a direct result of, of scarcity and fear and anything I didn't, I did based on scarcity and fear is a losing proposition and anything that I've done based on abundance and love and giving has turned out great. So wanting to be this famous comedian didn't work out for me mostly because, well, A, because I didn't work that hard uh, looking back and B, because it was for all the wrong reasons. And I, I've said to people that I've gotten more love in two years of podcasting or now almost three than I did in almost 10 years of stand up, I think as a direct result of because I wanted to give something. And I stand up came from the selfish place of love me, love me, give me money, give me gifts, you know, give me drugs, like I want women to like me, all that bullshit that I was hung up in. And because I, and obviously I still struggle with that today. Obviously I'm not, you know, Gandhi over here. But to come from a place of giving and of love and of service is the place that I need to stay at if I want to be a success. Huh. You summed it up well. And now that concludes the knowledge on Matt. So what's getting you out of bed in the morning? What are you really excited for? Well, there's kind of always another race to train for, for me. And the Ultra Beast is next. The Spartan Ultra Beast, it's, uh, they say 26 plus miles. The last two years, it's been 30 plus miles. Uh, untold obstacles. Uh, it's cold. It's on a mountain in, in Vermont. It's really hard. I've not finished two years in a row. So it's like, I've got my eye on it to finish. And I really want to, you know, I want to finish this year and I want to finish strong. Um, so that's kind of, uh, and just to be, you know, staying in the center of it all of obstacle racing, I want to continue, you know, so far I've kind of positioned myself to be sort of the guy that people call for news and information. And I want to do that. And I'll say, we, you know, I got other writers and my partner, Christian that work with me on obstacle racing media. We want to continue to be that source, that trustworthy source of news and information. People know that they can trust us. All right, I like that. And go ahead and give yourself a plug on how the audience can follow up with you. Sure. So the website is obstacleracingmedia.com, and there you can find links to everything, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, podcast. Uh, the podcast is on iTunes under Obstacle Racing Media, so if you just search under that, uh, you, you'll find that. Uh, the book is called Down and Dirty, The Essential Training Guide for Obstacle Racing and Mud Runs. It's available in Barnes & Noble many other bookstores, and of course on Amazon. All right, Matt, thank you so much for your time and sharing your story with my community here on the Knowledge for Men show. Uh, I, I appreciate you asking me, and I definitely want to talk to you offline a little bit. Sure, no problem. And guys, that's going to wrap up episode 94 with Matt Davis. And hey guys, would love to get some more reviews on the podcast. Currently at 305 reviews at four and a half stars. And I've noticed that just recently I'm getting less reviews and it's uh, impacting the rankings of the podcast. And I really want to keep the rankings up because the higher the rankings, the more exposure. And I really believe in the content and the work that I'm doing here. So the higher the rankings, the more people that can be impacted around the world. So if you haven't left a review for this podcast, please do so. You can do that in iTunes when you search Knowledge for Men and go to Ratings and Review. And then go ahead and leave a rating and then write a little short review. I take all the feedback seriously and implement ASAP on all the ratings. So if you've had some impact on you know, Knowledge for Men has impacted you in some way, I would really appreciate a review 
on the podcast just to help increase the rankings and just to help it get more exposure. And I think that this content, if someone was really struggling, if there's a man out there who's really struggling, and if just having a higher ranking would allow this podcast to be more visible and he could get access to this, you know, and it could change his life, I think it's worth it. So I would really appreciate if you would leave a review on the Knowledge for Men podcast. Until next time, guys, I'll see you around. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast show. It's been a pleasure having you be a part of a thriving community of men who want to crush it in all aspects of life. I'm on a mission here to inspire millions of guys. And with your help, we're going to make a dent in the universe. Check out knowledgeformen.com for a ton of free content that's designed to help you live a remarkable life. Again, that's knowledgeformen.com. I hope to see you there. And always remember, 2014 is the official year of the crush, where we take action to get the life we've always dreamed of. This is your host, Andrew Farabee, and until next time, let's do it.